Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. In the Legislative Building in Regina, we have Premier Scott Moe and Minister of Rural and Remote Health, Warren Kading. Joining us over the phone line is Dr. Saqib Shahab. And in Saskatoon, from the, the Saskatchewan Health Authority, is Dr. Susan Shaw. Uh, I believe the Premier and Dr. Shahab will both have opening remarks, followed by time for questions. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Today we are reporting 50 additional cases. 44 are in one Hutterite community. This is a very serious situation for our province. The Minister of Rural and Remote Health and the Health Ministry as well as the Saskatchewan Health Authority are working with our Hutterite communities across Saskatchewan to ensure that we are able to uh, get this outbreak under control. The vast majority are cooperating and we appreciate that. However, there are a few that are not quite as cooperative. Uh, they are somewhat resistant to allowing uh, testing. Some are telling us that they are not willing to change some of their communal, communal practices such as eating and worshipping together in groups that is larger than what is allowable under the public health order. As I said, many are making the necessary adjustments and for, them, for that I thank them. But there are a few that are not. This needs to change. It needs to change immediately. Today I want to take a moment to speak directly to everyone in approximately 80 Hutterite communities across this province. Our province, Saskatchewan, has been very successful in reducing the spread of COVID-19 because we all changed our lifestyle just a bit. We all made the necessary sacrifices. Many have greatly reduced their travel plans. We stopped visiting our loved ones in nursing homes, in long-term care centres and in hospitals. We stopped attending large weddings and funerals. When there was an outbreak in a community or in a hospital or even a, in a business or at an event, we very quickly volunteered to do the necessary testing, to do the necessary contact tracing and to ultimately self-isolate if required to ensure that we are able to get the spread of COVID-19 under control. Every single one of us in this province has been asked to and the vast majority have changed how we are living each and every day. You all need to as well. If you don't, many will get sick in your community. Some will get very sick. Some will die. We want to prevent that. We want to work with you to ensure that occurs. We are prepared to do everything that we can to dedicate and we dedicate the full resources of the government of Saskatchewan to ensure that that will not happen. But it only works with everyone's complete cooperation each of us. This is how we will protect your community and ours. This is how we will protect your friends, your family, as well as ours. And this is how we will save lives. Again, I want to stress that many Hutterite communities, uh, like many Saskatchewan communities, are fully cooperating. Many have changed their practices to stop the spread of COVID-19 and it's working. As a result, some of our Hutterite communities are on the backside of their outbreak and for that I congratulate them and thank them for their efforts. What you're doing, it is working and it is working well. You're protecting yourselves, you're protecting your family and you are protecting your community as well as the communities around you. You are protecting your neighbours. So for that again I say thank you. In the coming days the Saskatchewan Health Authority will be visiting uh, each and every Hutterite community in the province to assess the situation to provide information on safe physical distancing, hygiene practices, to ensure that non-essential travel is being restricted and to do testing and contact tracing if it is deemed necessary. To ensure that everyone is following the public health orders that are in place that apply to each of us in all corners of this province. The Saskatchewan Health Authority is there to help you. It is there to support you. The Saskatchewan Health Authority is here to keep you safe. And I am asking for each and every one of you's complete cooperation in the days ahead. Do you, uh, Dr. Shahab, do you have a couple of opening comments? Thank you, Premier. So um, I would like to start by offering my condolences to the family and friends of the individual who passed away, and that was reported yesterday. So we are at 17 deaths. And like the Premier said, you know, we really need the worst out. And so... Dr. Shahab, we're having some difficulty hearing you. Hello, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? 
Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, so I'll just start again. So I just want to start by offering my condolences to the family and friends of the uh, individual who passed away and the death was announced yesterday in the news release. And this really is a reminder for us that while in some cases uh, COVID can be asymptomatic or mild, it can, in many cases, too many, lead to hospitalization, ICU admission and death and in some cases, long-term health effects. And we absolutely need to work and continue to be successful in keeping our case rates, case rates low. Um, as the Premier mentioned, we are reporting 50 new cases of COVID-19 in Saskatchewan, of which 44 were in a communal living setting within the RM of Star City, east of Melford. And this again emphasizes that no part of Saskatchewan is COVID-free. And once COVID enters a setting with this close contact, it spread extremely aggressively and rapidly. And we can only flatten the curve if all of us do our part. Most of us are doing our part, but any slippage in all of us doing our part will result in our collective failure to flatten the curve. The, increase uh, the increases in a specific communal living setting is a result of aggressive contact tracing and increased testing. And for this, um, I would like to again, like the Premier said, thank uh, residents both off and off uh, on colonies for coming forward to be tested. This really is not something that we should be afraid of. Testing and contact tracing is essential along with physical distancing to help us keep the curve flat. And we must recognize the people who come forward for testing and not absolutely not stigmatize any community or group for uh, helping all of us to understand COVID transmission and control it. It's also really important that we all understand the guidelines to keep people safe. The guidelines are the upper limit of what we should be doing. And it was very disappointing and concerning to hear that um, there were some teams that defied guidelines, um, tried to mask their identities to play in an in, in, in interprovincial tournament. Sports teams are about, most sports teams in Saskatchewan are complying with the guidelines and playing locally. Sports are about developing leadership skills, team building, and fair play. And actions to circumvent this are certainly setting a bad example and jeopardizing the entire sector. And again, I would like to reemphasize that anyone who did go on this trip needs to self-monitor for symptoms. And uh, we need to again stress that the guidelines are the absolute maximum for most of us, we should be well below the absolute maximum, whether we are having gatherings, whether we are meeting each other socially. Uh, we have to practice physical distancing, um, wear a mask indoors, uh, keep our virtual household bubble under 15, as small as possible. And if we do have a gathering of up to 30, maintain physical distancing between members who are not part of our household or immediate virtual bubble. In terms of cases, again, we have cases throughout Saskatchewan, 44 in the north now due to uh, the cluster in the communal living setting in um, the uh, north e east, three in the south, two in Regina, and one in the central part of Saskatchewan. And 322 of the 1268 reported cases are considered active. 15 people are in hospital, 10 in inpatient care, three in Saskatoon, two in the central region, four in the south, and one in Regina and five are in intensive care, three in Saskatoon and two in Regina. So again, as expected with the increase in cases, hospitalizations are also trending upwards. And this uh, should be of great concern to all of us. Of the 1268 cases in the province, 202 are due to travel, 670 now community contacts, including mass gatherings, 299 have no known exposures. Again, this is a flag for us that we need to keep our contact small, even as we go out and about enjoying the summer safely and enjoying all the opportunities that we can with uh, the allowed businesses. A further 150 are under investigation by local public health. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. We now have time for questions. We'll take our first question from the phone line. We have Zach Vissera with the Star Phoenix. Hi there. Um, Dr. Shahab, you mentioned that the increase that we noted um, in the Northeast today, the 44 cases, was due to uh, aggressive contact tracing and testing. 
I'm wondering if similar efforts are underway in other communal living settings in the province, and, and if we can brace ourselves, as it were, or expect similar large increases in, in a single area in the days and weeks to come. Thank you for this question. So I think there's two specific uh, uh, answers to that. One is that in specific communal living settings, like the Premier said, uh, the Saskatchewan Health Authority is reaching out to each and every uh, communal living setting, each and every hard right colony, to work together with them so that on the first sign of illness, a case is isolated and there's no further transmission. Unfortunately, in many situations, uh, by the time testing happens, transmission has happened for several days or weeks, uh, resulting in significant hardship both for the community and you know, uh, potential risk to surrounding communities as well. So uh, there is now active outreach to every colony over the next days and weeks. And, and this is not just a one-time thing. This, is, this must be ongoing as long as there's a pandemic. There's not a one-time outreach and that's it. This will have to be ongoing. And secondly, we all understand that in settings where we are crowded and unable to keep a physical distance or a mask, uh, you know, transmission does happen. Uh, in many cases, when we have mild illness and we isolate at home, we are successful in preventing further transmission to other household members. But on occasion, despite our best efforts, it does happen. Uh, but, you know, um, we have all learned how to better improve physical distancing and mask use, even in the household setting when we have a family member who's unwell with COVID, but well enough to stay at home. We've seen through the heroic efforts of people who did not take a single day off since the pandemic began. These are healthcare workers. These are individuals who work in grocery stores, gas stations. These are the real heroes of the pandemic who have worked day in and day out, keeping everyone safe, providing essential services, but keeping themselves safe. So we know that physical distancing and where appropriate, appropriate mask use works. And we have to follow their example. And, I'm, and I would just add by saying that we have been extremely fortunate through strict guidelines for staff cohorting and visiting that we have not had the outbreaks in our long-term care facilities, personal care homes, and assisted living facilities that are so devastating but, you know, we need to remain vigilant because now with our increasing case numbers, all those settings are at risk. And even we, if we have relaxed visitation guidelines, we need to be very thoughtful when we visit our loved ones in those settings. Thank you. Zach, I would just add uh, to that. Uh, one of the individuals working day in and day out uh, since the start of this pandemic is the, the person that just provided that answer for you, and that's Dr. Shahab, who's attempting to spend a few days with his family uh, this week and is uh, gracious enough to continue to call in to provide information to the uh, the people of the province and for that uh, doctor i thank you and i, I thank your family um, i'd just like to make a, a comment or two on the outreach that the sha is making and the severity of the situation that we are uh, working our way through and 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 this isn't a you know a conversation or or actions that that we uh, like to be taking uh, but we have said that we will have outbreaks across this province and we have one that is occurring right now. Um, our uh, reporting is is not about um, in any way trying to stigmatize anyone in our in our community. We uh, have reported uh, where outbreaks have occurred uh, previous to this uh, most notably in Lalash, but we also reported in a, a health center in Lloydminster, a health center in Prince Albert, other health centers uh, in the province. A second time uh, in Prince Albert, we reported an outbreak when we had a number of hospitalizations that uh, had no uh, known uh, contact uh, uh, with someone with COVID-19. We've reported numerous businesses across the province when uh, we felt that uh, public safety and public, uh, the, the, the greater uh, need uh, for uh, public health and public safety uh, was required. We reported uh, to the minutia of a snowmobile rally uh, north of Prince Albert uh, when that occurred uh, to ensure that people are informed uh, when they need to be, when an outbreak is occurring. So what we are doing here today is not about stigmatizing anyone in our society. It's about ensuring everyone is aware uh, where these outbreaks are occurring and when. Um, in saying that, no one uh, in Saskatchewan should uh, stigmatize uh, uh, anyone uh, in their community or is visiting their, their community or should assume um, that uh, because they may be a, a Hutterite, uh, that they have COVID. Uh, there are many, many uh, communities across this province, Hutterite communities that are uh, doing everything that they can to ensure that COVID-19 does not enter their community, like there are many Saskatchewan communities uh, doing the very same. And for that, I say thank you. Uh, and I would just say that we need everyone 
uh, to partake in that. Here, here's the severity of, of what we're dealing with. In Saskatchewan now, we have 322 cases. 244 of those cases are in our Hutterite communities. This brings us up to over 300 cases. Um, those are active cases, 244 of 322. That's a 76% of Saskatchewan's cases are in our, our Hutterite communities. Um, we have about 6,000 Hutter, Hutterites across, Hutterite community members across uh, the province. So um, with over 300 members, we are running uh, a, above a 5% five, five infection rate uh, in, those, in those communities. This is uh, as, as high of an infection rate of anything I'm aware of in North America, and that is why we are taking this very seriously. By contrast, uh, the broader Saskatchewan infection rate is one-tenth of one percent. Um, that is uh, the goal, the target, uh, for sure, that we are, are heading for. So uh, the, the Saskatchewan Health Authority, uh, given the severity of this outbreak, we are providing every opportunity for the Saskatchewan Health Authority to support our Hutterite friends, our Hutterite communities uh, across this province in the same way that the Saskatchewan Health Authority reached out to support uh, those in Alash, to support those in any other community in the province. Uh, we most certainly uh, will be doing that. Um, so. There is uh, the part of the outreach of the Saskatchewan Health Authority is yes uh, to provide the opportunity for testing where it's desired or where it's required, um, but also to ensure that the public health recommendations of public health orders are very clear um, in all communities, including our Hutterite communities, and very clear that they apply to all Saskatchewan uh, communities. Those uh, uh, ensuring that we we limit our travel where we can, and the vast majority of Saskatchewan people have limited their travel to a certain number of people. Um, out, of, out of their community, going to the same places and to only essential travel uh, where necessary. Uh, we have, for example, grocery stores where one, one family member will enter the grocery stores. Um, the, the public health order around our gathering size and limiting our gathering size to, to 30 people, ensuring uh, that we don't have these large gatherings where we can rapidly spread uh, the COVID-19 virus. That includes uh, weddings, that includes funerals, that includes uh, um, all of the events uh, that we attend, uh, 30 people or in the case of, of, uh, of our worship services uh, with appropriate physical distancing uh, up to about a 30% capacity. Again, uh, the SHA will be uh, um, providing uh, the opportunity uh, for testing. Uh, but I would just close with this. Uh, the, the outreach that uh, will be led by the Minister of Rural and Remote Health um, to all 80 of our Hutterite communities in the province in the coming days, the outreach uh, by the Saskatchewan Health Authority, uh, we are there to work with our communities. We are there to support our communities in exactly the same way in exactly the same way that the Saskatchewan Health Authority has reached out and supported any other community that has, an, had, 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 has had an outbreak here in Saskatchewan. You have a follow-up, Zach? I, I do, yes, thank you. Um, my question, I guess, now is you, you mentioned there that most people, uh, Premier Mo, have given up travel, have, have limited their travel in response to what is happening. Um, it, it is quite evident that, you know, this, this uh, communal living setting in Melford is hundreds of kilometers from the first outbreaks that we saw in communal living settings in the southwest of the province. Um, is there continued travel between these communal living settings? And is that responsible for the outbreak or are these unrelated outbreaks that are, that are happening concurrently? Uh, Dr. Shahab, would you have any comments on the, uh, the spread of the virus uh, between communities? Thank you. So uh, whenever we look at infectious disease epidemiology, it's well defined that uh, you know, uh, outbreaks do propagate or spread within groups that uh, interact with each other. And again, COVID does not discriminate. Uh, in March, we saw propagation of COVID in um, individuals who were playing, uh, in, uh, who were curling in bounce fields. So again, that's the flag uh, earlier about the risk of transmission in sporting teams and why it's so important to play in your own bubble. Because in March, we saw COVID jumping from one bomb spiel tournament to another. And it's exactly the same for other cultural religious groups, uh, individuals who interact closely for personal or social or business reasons. It's only um, um, rational to assume that that's where transmission will spread more easily. And that's why even when we are out and about, uh, you know, doing our social or business interactions, we must follow all the rules around not going out to free ill practicing physical distancing, wearing a mask when indoors, and of course, isolating ourselves at the first sign of symptoms and seeking testing. Thanks. We'll take our next question from the room, Steph. Yeah, for either the Premier or the Minister, 
when you say there's a few colonies that are resistant to testing or changing uh, their communal lifestyle, can you quantify how much is a few? And then what in detail is the government's plan to deal with the fact that they are not wanting to cooperate and, and kind of follow these public health orders? I, I just had a high level say that we've been working with the Hyterian, Hyterian Safety Council uh, for some time now. And, uh, and now we are, it's clear in the numbers that we need to do more than that. Um, so now we are working uh, directly with the, the Hutterite communities across the province. I've asked the Minister of Rural and Remote Health to uh, start that outreach uh, with the SHA and uh, that is occurring. And now you've talked to a number of leaders already and I'll, I'll let the Minister of Rural and Remote Health uh, address that. Certainly. Well, our number one concern is, is compliance as we have that expectation from all, uh, all residents in the province. Um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of the compliance is also based around education you know, just even understanding the virus. And I know uh, even us in this room are still trying to understand this virus. This is still a, a very young virus that we, we are still learning every day as to what happens with it. And and uh, I know even the conversation I had this morning with a couple of uh, how to write leaders was talking about asymptomatic uh, uh, patients or individuals that maybe aren't even expressing uh, symptoms, but are actually still testing positive uh, for the virus. And, you know, it's a lot of education and, and trying to understand, uh, to get that into the communities to understand what the risks are with, uh, with the number of these, these items. So the, uh, the other thing is get consensus. You know, we certainly need everyone to understand and be on the same page as to what we're going to do moving forward. And certainly uh, offering tests for those that want it and, uh, and then uh, working on uh, isolation requirements, uh, you know, explaining what isolation is and, and as well working towards the public health orders as to, you know, limiting sizes and, and, and uh, sizes of groups and, and working with the different events that they may host as to what uh, some of the best practices are that have worked in, in other communities. And then I guess just also to explain that time isn't on our side that we need all of this to happen very quickly. And this, this, we have a very short time in order to, to keep this you know, under control. And I think we've been doing a very good job of that right now. But obviously with some of these numbers, you know, it does happen very quickly. So just explaining that, that time isn't our friend in, in any of these situations as well. So a lot of it has to do with education. And then a lot of it is making sure that they have the tools and, and the opportunities to utilize those tools when they're available. Follow up stuff. I can understand uh, the desire to want to focus on education um, more so than maybe measures that would be seen as punitive, but the government does have power to issue stay-at-home orders, for police to issue fines, for roadblocks, and, and take more heavy-handed approaches to stop uh, the spread of this, which I'm sure is being spread quite quickly in a communal living setting like a Hutterite colony. So why, given the severity and how quickly this is spreading, not take measures such as those? Well, I would say right now, uh, we're certainly encouraging compliance in each one of these communities, and we are getting that in the majority of cases, but we've never precluded either that we wouldn't uh, have to take further steps if they're required. And we've shown that in certain uh, communities around the province as well, that maybe uh, weren't able to provide the uh, resources, maybe were shorthanded in, uh, in what they could do to set up roadblocks, and they asked us to help and intervene and, and take part and support them in those actions. So. If that opportunity arises, we will certainly support them in that. Uh, but what we've seen is the majority have, have taken uh, compliance. Uh, they have done the things that they need to do. Uh, I talked uh, uh, earlier in the week about some of the innovative things that they've done and certainly recognizing that. And that's also something that we want to make sure that each colony has the opportunity to understand what the best practices were. And also just recognize the fact that we have now had a number of colonies that maybe had significant infections before that are now at zero or maybe have one case left. So uh, just explain to them that if you take all these orders into account, like those initial colonies did, that there is a very positive outcome on this, and that is to have uh, minimal or zero uh, cases in their, in their community as well as having people get back to health very quickly. So. I just say, uh, you, you know, there, there, there are powers that the government uh, does have, and, and there may be instances in the near future where possibly those powers may be, may be ha may have to uh, be utilized. Um, in saying that, uh, we have had far more uh, collaboration than we have not 
had uh, in in our engagement with uh, not only Hutterit communities but any community here in the province. And any time we have success, up to and, and including uh, the success that we've had in Alash, the success that we have had in some of the earlier outbreaks in Hutterit communities, it is always centered around um, the the, dis the dissemination of education around how this virus spreads, and then the, what the public health orders are, and then ultimately the voluntary compliance of individuals within the community. It has uh, what has uh, been responsible for Saskatchewan's success thus far. Uh, we're going to continue uh, down that road at the community level. Um, all 80 or 79 of our of our Hutterite communities will be contacted by uh, one of our health ministers in the days ahead, as well as the SHA, to provide any supports, any uh, any communication around education of what the public health recommendations are, what the public health orders are, and the requirement uh, to follow those orders. And uh, in the days ahead, um, we feel that we will have, um, and we hope that there will be. Uh, you know, vast collaboration and vast working together across this province as it is in the best interests of not only the health and safety of the individuals that uh, reside in our Hutterite communities, but also the health and safety of those that reside in and around uh, those communities in, in neighboring communities. And so we are, uh, you know, extending, uh, you know, our, our open hand uh, to support, to help, and to walk alongside uh, our Saskatchewan Hutterite communities. We'll take our next question from the phone line. We have Roberta Bell with Global. Hi, my question is regarding masks, which we heard the Premier talk about the possibility of what kind of reproductive number would we have to see for that uh, in Saskatchewan or in one area of Saskatchewan, and what is our current reproductive number? Uh, just a high-level comment, and then maybe Dr. Shahab would have a, a comment around masks. I, I, masks. I, I don't know that there would be a... Um, uh, an, an order that would come in and say everybody has to wear a mask uh, all of the time in the province. However, there are uh, certain instances, certain environments, certain uh, um, workplace environments, um, uh, hospitals and long-term care centers come to mind. Uh, um, I call them barber shops, but the beauty salons, hairdressers as well uh, are requiring masks, uh, mask usage. Uh, th those areas where you're not able to um, to, to create your physical distance uh, obviously would be the first place where mask usage would uh, begin and already has uh, been mandated in those environments and it may expand um, by, uh, by the sector um, or it may expand by the region depending on the situation. Every uh, situation is a little different as we see um, outbreaks uh, in this pre-vaccine COVID environment as we've come to know it. Um, each outbreak is a little different. The outbreak in, in the northern Saskatchewan uh, uh, community of Lalash and Clearwater was, is a little different than what we're experiencing uh, here today. Um, I think uh, the, 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 the real premise around masks that I re remember is, is are Dr. Shahab's words, is uh, they are helpful in, in protecting those around you if you uh, are to wear a mask and any time that you are not able to create that physical distance like we try to at these uh, at these press conferences, uh, you should uh, wear a mask. And, and so I would encourage Saskatchewan people at this point in time uh, to not concern themselves too much with, uh, you know, are we going to have to use masks and in what settings, but to carry one and to use them in the settings, to use their own common sense to, to put it on in the settings where they are unable to create that physical distance that uh, is the ultimate protection uh, from COVID-19. Uh, Dr. Shahab, you have anything to add or, or correct a, a, of what I said? Thank you, Premier. So I'll just speak a bit about the reproductive number and then about mask use. Uh, so first of all, you know, the reproductive number is one of the tools we use as well as, you know, the context of transmission uh, and testing rates and test positivity rate to understand what happened in the last two weeks and what does that inform us going forward. So the reproductive number, uh, or, or, or the effective reproductive number now for central and south Saskatchewan is 3.19, so concerningly high. But we understand the transmission risk. We understand that the transmission is primarily happening within communal living settings. Obviously, uh, a reproductive number, even half of that, but with, without understanding transmission settings, would be of greater concern. But having said that, we can't minimize the fact that the reproductive number is high in the uh, southwest and central parts of um, uh, uh, the province and now will be high in the northeast as well. And that's pulling the Saskatchewan reproductive up number up to 2.94. But we can also gain comfort and confidence from the far north, which also went very high, but they're now at 0.84. So the far north and north, um, the northwest, they are 8.84. 
So I think we have to understand that while the reproductive number does spike up, as long as we understand the contours of transmission and can act rapidly, it does respond to actions that all of us take and, uh, and it can go in the opposite direction. On mask use, you know, we've always, all, obviously been learning more and more about the benefits of masks. We have show, learned that frontline essential workers in healthcare, in personal care services, are heroes in healthcare, now more and more in hairdressing salons, uh, in grocery stores, other retail environments. By using a mask, they have kept, kept themselves safe. They have kept customers safe. We have not seen a surge in transmission. And um, wearing a mask protects you, you, it protects others you are serving, and if everyone wears a mask in those settings, where you try to maintain the two meter distance, but you can't. Someone, you know, we've all had uh, concerned grocery uh, staff uh, who will come forward to help someone who needs a bit of help. So it is important to be considerate and not just uh, rely on staff of businesses to wear a mask to protect you, but to wear a mask and show the same consideration back. And, and as we, you know, as we are now doing more and more things uh, compared to when we were in lockdown, you know, masks are another additional layer of protection that is evident that, that will be essential in seeing us through this. And especially as the weather changes and we move outdoors, you know, having a mask on you and, and wearing it when required should be just part of a daily routine. Thank you. Do you have a follow-up, Roberta? Yes, I was just wondering what kind of, I guess, plans the government has around um, suggesting or mandating masks for specific communities or, uh, I guess, geographic jurisdictions, potentially communal living settings that could have high rates of the virus right now. Is there any plans to take that jurisdictionally under the public health order if there is an outbreak in a specific region? I guess, again, those, uh, what, what Dr. Shahab and I had just said around uh, w with respect to having a mask with you and utilizing it when you are unable to create that physical distance applies um, in communal living settings. It applies uh, to everyone in the province. Um, the, the, there may be, um, you know, some of that conversation that may ad advance with uh, Minister Kading's um, uh, phone calls over the course of the next uh, few days with uh, each of, of the leader, leadership groups in those communal living settings. We'll see what transpires uh, with that. Um, but Dr. Shahab, I will again let you uh, comment with respect to the, uh, you know, the broader plans for, for mask usage here in the province. Thank you. So just like physical distancing and the general guidelines about keeping our contact small and our virtual household small apply to everyone, Mask use should also apply to everyone because that's how we keep our numbers low. If we just respond to uh, these uh, 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 fundamental measures only after we see an increase in case numbers, then we've, to a large extent, uh, you know, uh, not been able to prevent something that all of us should try to prevent. But having said that, obviously we uh, uh, will have to uh, see if there's an increased transmission, um, that there may be a stronger um, uh, uh, requirement to wear a mask. Uh, certainly at this point, it's a strong recommendation, and many people are increasingly complying. Um, you know, we, um, uh, all of us, uh, I'm sure, see uh, more and more people complying, and I would expect everyone who's uh, in this media briefing that, you know, if we are, have not been practicing mask use indoors uh, consistently, this, this, these are the opportunities to think about that and talk to our family members and friends about it, and that's you know, that voluntary compliance indoors all the time is what will uh, see us through at a population level. But obviously, you know, mask use is already mandatory in healthcare. It's mandatory in personal care services. And, um, you know, if there's an outbreak situation like in a communal living setting, uh, if you're outside the immediate household, mask use uh, is, uh, is required. And similarly, if you have a person who you're taking care of in the house, you know, um, when you have to provide close, uh, you know, care to a person who's ill in your household, a mask use is required. So again, we, uh, obviously, there are situations where um, uh, mask use uh, may be required because of uh, higher case uh, numbers. But in general, we have seen that if all of us do the right thing, that's how we keep numbers low. And responding to an issue locally, while uh, helpful, you know, it does not affect in fact, the fact that we are trying to prevent these outbreaks in the first place. Thank you. We'll take our next question from the room. Mark. 
Mr. Premier, what's your reaction to the Saskatchewan hockey teams that traveled to Manitoba to play in a tournament last weekend? Well, it's disappointing. Um, it's disappointing as I know the Saskatchewan uh, Hockey Association has been well informed uh, with respect to the you know, the guidelines and the protocols that have been put forward for a, uh, a safe return to play not only of hockey, a, a sport that I love and at one time thought I might not be too bad at, but as it turns out, I'm not uh, very good at it. Um, but it is disappointing. Uh, there is, and, and it impacts everyone. Um, they are going outside of uh, what the parameters are and really putting at risk uh, um, the the entire safe restart of sports so that we have not just with hockey but with uh, you know all of the sports uh, that we have. And so I you know I, I'd say that I'm I'm just disappointed that uh, you know a few teams would uh, put the entire uh, safe restart of the province uh, at, at at risk. You, you know as I said earlier, how we have been successful in Saskatchewan has been through. Uh, the public uh, dissemination of, of education around what our public health orders are, uh, what our public health uh, recommendations are. And then ultimately, uh, the voluntary compliance of those recommendations. And here is a prime and going example of, uh, you know, a group of people uh, that have put their own self-interest ahead of the, uh, you know, the greater public health uh, and safety of their neighbours, of their family and of their community. Any public health orders, and will there be any ramifications of that? I, have, I haven't dug into that. I don't know if Warren, you want to speak to that, or Dr. Shahab uh, to that specifically. Dr. Shahab, you added in your opening comments. Uh, you had made a few comments around that. There'll be a follow-up. Uh, uh, sorry, there'll be a follow-up to understand why uh, this happened and appropriate steps will be taken. We've always been very progressive in enforcement and public health orders, and we will uh, advise based on the initial assessment. But again. Uh, like the Premier said, while public health orders and fines are important, we have to recognize that we all have a role to play all the time in keeping our case numbers low. Um, everyone in Saskatchewan, including uh, young adults, have been extremely diligent in maintaining physical distancing, wearing masks. We see that all the time in our retail environments and places where you work and play. Uh, where it's required, you know, masks are worn, where it's required physical distancing is maintained, not so much when we're outdoors in enjoying our summer. So I think that's the spirit in which we all must move forward. But of course, if there's uh, progressions in the, uh, while knowing that these are the guidelines, uh, there should be a follow-up with appropriate, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, actions as, as appropriate. Thank you. I'm, I'm sure there will be that follow-up. And what, what's most uh, disturbing uh, to me is uh, um, Dr. Shahab had spoken and I have spoken about the voluntary compliance with the public health orders and guidelines that are in place. And there are so many Saskatchewan people that have sacrificed so much more than a hockey tournament in, in Winnipeg, for example. Uh, there are people in this province that are foregoing um, foregoing uh, wedding ceremonies or foregoing memorial services, celebrations of life for people that have passed uh, over the course of the last number of months and likely uh, going to have to forego uh, those uh, in for the months into the future. There's people that have not seen uh, their loved ones in long-term care centres, uh, their, their family in long-term care centres. There are grandparents across this province that are limiting uh, the access to their grandchildren. Um, and it, it pains me to be in a situation where that is actually occurring, but they're doing it for their own protection and the protection of their family. Um, it just seems uh, that that it, it, it just is, is so disturbing um, that when we have seen the sacrifice of so many in this province that we see someone that is unwilling to sacrifice a, a hockey tournament uh, one weekend out of province. We'll take our next question on the phone line. We have Adam Hunter with CBC. Hi, um, this is for the SHA or whoever wants to answer the question. Um, I'm wondering why testing numbers have been fluctuating and if there's any concern, as we've seen in other parts of the world, an uh, example would be Australia, where people uh, said an outbreak there was partly attributed to people not wanting to wait for their test results and then going back to work or socializing. And if that at all um, is a concern of the government given, uh, you know, we've heard people waiting for five to seven days for a test or for results, and these are cases where they may be in close contact with someone who is who has COVID-19. Dr. Shahab or Dr. Shah? So maybe I can speak first and then Dr. Shah, if you would like to add. So first of all, you know, we do understand that testing numbers can fluctuate on a day-to-day -day basis. If there's intense case finding, 
uh, on site. You know, testing numbers will go up, um, and there's there can be cyclical changes. But uh, on the whole, testing is headed in the right direction. We were quite low for a while, but now that we see increased number of cases, you know, testing is going in the right direction. I do want to emphasize that while it's important for anyone with symptoms or any concerns to get tested, you should not isolate off, uh, when you get your test result. You must isolate at the first sign of symptoms or any concerns and seek testing, but remain isolated if you have any symptoms. Practice physical distancing all the time. I think there's been some uh, um, uh, issues where, you know, there's a public service announcement and people who went to an location were asked to get tested, were asked to self-monitor for 14 days. That's what we should all do. But if you have concerns, you can get tested, even if you're asymptomatic. But that doesn't mean that you should not monitor yourself for 14 days. Similarly, we've heard reports of where people have been asked to isolate for 14 days because there were contacts of a case. You still have to isolate for 14 days. You can't get tested on day five or six, and then if the test is negative, stop isolation. Isolation for 14 days, physical distancing all the time is essential. Testing, if you're symptomatic, helps you to decide if it's COVID or maybe uh, something else. But even then, if you're symptomatic, you have to remain isolated for 48 hours till the end of symptoms, even if the test is negative. And, and certainly, testing does not mean that you can shorten your period of isolation for two weeks as a close contact. So I'll just stop there and ask if Dr. Shaw has any comments. Thank you for that, Dr. Shahab. I, I think that's important. That's one of the most important messages is that um, the self-isolation and the, it, it's not driven by the test results. It's driven by symptoms and by contact. We certainly are working to address the increase in testing results as quickly as possible to make sure that testing, uh, everybody has timely access uh, when, when they want to test, and we certainly encourage people who want to seek a test to do so, either through contacting 811, their family physician or their nurse practitioner. Uh, we certainly recognize that with the increased uh, criteria, we have seen increased demand, and that's a good thing, and we continue to work to meet that demand. Within that increased demand, though, we will continue to prioritize certain groups of people, and these are um, people who are either symptomatic, people who have been directed to seek testing as part of contact tracing, healthcare workers, and people who are living in vulnerable situations or are part of a vulnerable population. And those, those are the people that we will continue to prioritize while making sure that everybody who seeks a test does get access to a test in a, in a, in a suitable time. But just to em emphasize, um, it is not the test result that drives your self-isolation. It's your symptoms. It's your conversation with your healthcare provider. And it's taking the uh, seriously the measures to make sure that you're socially distanced, you're self-isolating when appropriate, that you're wearing a mask when you can't be physically distanced, and you pay a lot of attention to hand hygiene. Thank you. Follow-up, Adam? I'll add to that as well is that uh, we are adding to our 811 lineup. We've got uh, we're, uh, open applications now for more people for 811, as well as even expanding our hours of operation at a number of our uh, certainly our larger testing centers and in, in our larger centers as well. In addition to that, um, you know, when we look at maybe at the at the higher level um, and and more strategic level on where we're going with in testing as a nation, um, part of the the Safe Restart uh, program, and I was just on a call with uh, the, the Prime Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister, and our other Premiers earlier today. Um, but part of that Safe Restart Agreement is to provide uh, some funding and resources for expanded testing, contact tracing, as well as some data management um, in the uh, the weeks and months ahead, as we do have some months ahead of us uh, in this pre-vaccine COVID environment. Uh, the, the, the Canada has a target of 60,000 tests uh, is their phase one target. We are at that target. That our share of that target here in Saskatchewan, they have a, a phase two target of achieving 200,000 tests across the nation. Now that doesn't say that automatically Saskatchewan would have to climb to 6,000 tests, um, although we will be working towards increasing our testing capacity. The testing numbers are a different conversation, but the testing capacity that we have um, is important for us to have as we go in uh, to this fall. And so we'll be uh, you know, looking at how we can expand our testing capacity here in the province, but also participating in the uh, in the more f the more national discussion around potentially some mobile testing capacity that can get to certain areas of the province, mobile contact tracing capacity that can address uh, any outbreaks that may occur, not just in Saskatchewan, but in, in other areas of the nation. And an example of, of how this support has worked already 
uh, was even pre, uh, previous to signing the Safe Restart Agreement between the provinces and the federal government, provinces, territories in the federal government, uh, the, the federal government was able to access uh, for us, to provide access to us, a thousand Gen Expert uh, cartridges to, to utilize in our outbreak in northern Saskatchewan, where uh, testing capacity was not so much the issue, but um, actual turnaround time of those tests was an issue given uh, uh, the remoteness of the community of Lalash and Clearwater. So, you know, that was appreciated at the time. Uh, those tests uh, were utilized uh, as well, and it's an example of how we are uh, working together across the nation to ensure that we have the appropriate testing capacity, contact tracing capacity, and, and data management capacity uh, to allow for our economies to reopen, but ensure uh, that we can continue to identify, um, uh, contact trace, and isolate uh, this virus. Follow up, Adam? I, I, I was hoping that uh, maybe Premier Mo and uh, the Minister could give a few more specifics on what's being considered uh, on colonies to try and uh, slow this spread down. Uh, we've heard similar sort of, uh, you know, warnings from yourself in the last couple of weeks about uh, people following the public health orders and not wanting to impose anything. But I'm wondering, uh, is there a couple of things that are being considered right now to help limit the spread or to ensure compliance uh, on colonies? There, there are many, many things that are already in, in, in action uh, in many colonies, as we've seen some that uh, were uh, infected a, a number of weeks ago are now, uh, you know, climbing down with their active cases. I believe one is down to one or, or no active cases in it. So, um, in, you know, part of it is about sharing uh, what is working uh, in many of the colonies that have had cases or, or don't have cases yet and don't have cases for a reason because they, like many other Saskatchewan communities, are, are taking the necessary precautions. Um, so our... our our effort in our outreach is to ensure that that maybe those few uh, communities that uh, don't have all of the the public education around uh, you know how and we are learning about this virus on a daily and weekly basis but how they can ensure that they uh, can take necessary precautions with minor alterations to their daily life uh, to ensure that that COVID is not spreading uh, throughout um, their community not spreading to their family members and not spreading to those that they love. Um, starting with the outreach from the Minister of Rural and Remote Health so that we can work uh, closely and work together uh, with the full support of the, uh, of the communities but also uh, providing the full support of the Saskatchewan Health Authority. Uh, anything to add to that? Testing and tracing, right? That's, that's the key to, uh, to dealing with this all through the province and it's no different uh, dealing with that in, uh, in colonies or or any other uh, community. So it's testing and tracing is being able to uh, to test and you're seeing the results in some of our daily reports where we're seeing some very big numbers and that's from testing. And then also from doing the tracing, uh, knowing that there, uh, you know, there is still perhaps uh, travel between communities. Well, we need to know that. Uh, there's still travel into businesses. We need to know where, they're, where they were and uh, and just following that contact tracing. It, it's no different than anywhere else. It's testing and tracing. And that's what we did in Lalash, and we, the, the community there was successful. We'll take our next question on the phone line. We have Britton Gray with CJME. Yeah, we're just uh, got a question for you about, we got a photo in from a listener that says there, that appears like there was a Garment of Saskatchewan release saying that 44 of the possible cases were in the RM of Star City. Uh, is that the case? I think Dr. Shahab had addressed that in his, uh, in his opening comments. Um, uh, there's a number of iterations of news releases that will float around. If one of those uh, um, previous uh, iterations was up for a brief period, that could be the case. But uh, um, Dr. Shahab had, uh, do you want to uh, just repeat your comments uh, in, from your opening comments around uh, the location of this, the bulk of this outbreak today? Yes, the 40, 44 of the 50 cases today were in the, um, in a communal living setting within the RN of Star City, not in uh, specifically Star City itself. But again, uh, I just wanted to um, also highlight that I think the rapid spread in these settings just shows that while we can effectively prevent COVID transmission through all our actions, if we let our guard down, it's not the type of setting, whether it's a specific community, it's any setting where there's close contact, it can spread extremely rapidly. And we've seen that devastate parts of the world. We've seen that devastate 
countries with strong healthcare systems, states with strong healthcare systems. And, you know, that is why we are concerned that we must do everything we can in all the situations that we work in, live in, play in to prevent COVID transmission, understand the risk and mitigate that in the specific settings in which we live and work and play. Thank you. Follow up, Britton? Yeah, I'm just uh, wondering if uh, you've, you've been able to pinpoint yet exactly where this spread came from. Was it uh, between trial, between communities, some sort of event? Because uh, like you did say, there are, there are, most communities are adhering to all the guidelines and stuff, but there are some that haven't been. So again, you know, Minister Kading also mentioned discussions that have happened with human living settings about asymptomatic transmission. That is exactly why we have all these guidelines in the first place. If, if we could prevent COVID transmission just by simply staying home if you're sick, then we wouldn't have all those guidelines. And we know that 30 to 40 percent of COVID transmission happens from asymptomatic people. That's why we have to practice physical distancing all the time. We have to wear masks and we're indoors. And of course, uh, beyond that, stay home when we're sick and seek testing. Um, and uh, it's also well described that if you have groups that are connected uh, through family ties, through cultural affiliations, religious affiliations, you know, you have more interactions within uh, that setting. Or even, like I mentioned, if, you're, uh, if there are sports leagues playing international tournaments, We've seen transmission happen in February, March in conferences. Anytime people come together or um, connect because of social or business reasons, transmission happens. So it's not specific about a specific uh, setting, but y y you know we have seen transmission being propagated within communal living settings through those mechanisms. But that transmission can also as easily happen in any other setting where we don't practice uh, you know physical distancing in gatherings outside a virtual household. And we'll take our last question on the phone line. We have Nicole DiDonato with CTV. Hi, my question is to the Premier. So um, we've been hearing from tourism agencies and tour operators that um, they've been seeing an increase in people from uh, Manitoba and Alberta coming into the province, um, you know, this summer because of travel restrictions, of course, uh, internationally. Um, and, of course, these are some places where there has been a surge in COVID-19 cases. Um, what is your position on this? Is this something that we should be doing given the spike uh, both in our province and in these other provinces? Uh, well, from the beginning, we have recommended uh, against uh, really any non-essential uh, travel uh, throughout the province, but also outside of the province we've recommended, and Dr. Shahab may have something uh, to add on, on the details of this, but we've recommended also that interprovincial travel uh, should be kept at an absolute minimum uh, if, if possible. Um, that being said, um, there, as we reopen our borders and, and tourism is part of our economy, there are people that are, are traveling back and forth for work or for, um, you know, to, to get outside uh, with, with their families and to experience some of what not only their province has to offer, but what, uh, you know, Western Canada has to offer. So we, uh, you know, we ask people to be careful. Um, we ask people to be cautious. We ask people to respect and actually we expect uh, that they will abide by the public health recommendations and the orders that are in place here in the province. They're there uh, to keep everyone safe, to keep our families and our communities safe. Um, so the, the recommendation is if it is not necessary, um, you should reconsider. Um, but there is no, at, current, at the current time, no ban on, uh, on interprovincial travel in Saskatchewan, nor has there been uh, since the beginning of this. I would also just note quickly, um, there has been um, some international travel that has occurred throughout this as well um, for essential, essential services, um, essential goods that we uh, receive and provide uh, across our international border, not only into the U.S., but to other areas of the world. That's been at an absolute minimum. And for the most part, um, not 100%, but for the most part, it's, been, it's, it's occurred and, and occurred uh, relatively safely. So the, uh, the guidelines that are in place, um, they do work. Um, one of those guidelines is, however, if, if it isn't necessary, uh, we do discourage uh, interprovincial travel, but it's not banned. Uh, Dr. Shahab, anything to add? Yeah, thanks. So I think this is really important for us to remember that even though we are now able to travel for, uh, you know, not just essential business or essential family visit, but for, you know, routine business because our economy is reopening, or when we can't defer even a family visit or a holiday for a variety of reasons, you know, we can travel, but we have to remember that sometimes 
We may let our guard down when we're traveling. We have to do exactly the same things we are doing here when you travel to another province. Physical distancing, staying put wherever you are. If you get sick and call the local number to seek testing. If you're, you know, renting a B&B or renting, uh, an, a, 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 you know, try to travel with your household or virtual household. But if you're traveling with a bigger group, you know, have some precautions around cohorting so that if there is transmission, the numbers are small. And, and know where you're going. Know what the protocols are for calling 811, uh, what the requirements are in a specific location. Uh, I think those, those are essential, but I think this is the year to uh, stay closer to home for your holiday and, and keep your uh, travel closer to home as you enjoy the summer. Thank you. You have a follow-up, Nicole? No, thank you so much. That concludes our time for today. Thank you for joining us, everyone.